It's a big job, moving electricity from where it's produced to where it's used. It's the job of transmission and distribution systems and the people that keep them running. On the largest scale, these power delivery systems are continental networks of major electrical connections. Often, these networks are made up of many individual companies that produce, transmit, and distribute electricity. Each company is primarily responsible for supplying its own customers. But many individual systems are tied together to form a grid. Now when there's an unusually large demand from an area served by one company, other companies can supply additional to meet the demand. With many companies tied into the same power grid, electricity can be distributed in the required amounts to the areas that need it. To do your job in your system, you need to know something about what it takes to get electricity from where it's made to where it's used. You have to be able to recognize the major components that make up a transmission and distribution system. And you have to know what each component does to make the system work. Now, to see how a transmission and distribution system, or T&D system, works, we don't have to look at an entire power grid. Let's look at a smaller part of the big picture and see how an individual company and their consumers fit into the grid. An individual company typically has a number of power plants to provide several sources of electricity within the local system. The power they produce is used but too large to see the individual components that take electricity from its source to its destination. To learn what a transmission and distribution system is and get acquainted with its basic components, we're going to look at the simplest possible T&D system. We'll trace the path of electricity from a single power plant to the consumers in its local area. We'll start here, at the power plant. This is where electricity is produced or generated. It's the source of electricity for the local system and its consumers. From here, power begins its long journey to the homes, offices, and factories where it's used. From the power plant, electricity flows to the first major component of the TND system, the switchyard. The switchyard is used as a connecting point between the local system and the regional grid. Through the array of switches in the yard, electricity can be received from the grid or from any of the power plants in the local system. The switchyard also controls the output of electricity. It can route power to the grid or pass it along to the next component in the local system, transmission lines, along this stage of its journey. The pathway they create takes power from the switchyard and leads it to the next component in the system, the substation. The substation transmission lines. From the substation, the electricity is routed along the final stage of its journey to the consumer. Distribution lines are the last component in the T&D system. By carrying electricity from the substation to where it's used, distribution lines form the direct link between the consumers and the rest of the electric. All of the components of the T&D system are for this one purpose, carrying electricity along its journey from the power plant to the customer. Well now, we've basically seen what a transmission and distribution system is and what it does. We've also traced the path of electricity through a typical T&D system and identified its major components along the way. During the rest of this program, we'll take a closer look at each of their components and their individual parts so that you'll be able to recognize them in your own system. When we continue, we'll learn more about the components in the T&D system and see just how each one functions to get electricity from where it's produced to where it's needed. So far, in our study of transmission and distribution systems, we've explored the major components that are common to all T&D systems and traced the flow of electricity from where it's produced to where it's used. Throughout the rest of this program, electrical pressure. It's the driving force that causes electrical flow. Voltage is measured in units called volts. Now the house represents the consumer. Many of the devices in the house consume electrical energy. In electrical terms, we call these devices the load on the system. Now let's see what happens when we connect the source to the load. We've created an electrical circuit. A circuit is a loop, a complete path for electricity to force through the load and back to the source. The amount of flow at a given time is called current. It's measured in units of amperes, or amps for short.
Whenever we have voltage and a complete circuit, current flow will resistance it has. Now resistance is in opposition to the current flow. Resistance is kind of a bottleneck flow of current. The more resistance there is, the less current flow you'll have. It takes both voltage and current to perform work. Taken together, the two factors determine the electrical factor consumed by the load. Power is simply the electrical energy consumed in performing work. In homes and businesses, we measure power consumption in units called watts and add them up over all of the hours that power is used. At power plants, measuring watts tells us how much power is being consumed by all of the homes and businesses being served. From this simple example, we've learned the basic concepts that apply to delivering power in any electrical system, including the transmission and distribution system we saw earlier. A transmission and distribution system is an electrical system providing a path for current flow from the source through the load and back to the source. Now let's begin to break down the system and examine each part individually. We'll start with the source, the power plant. Now technically, a power plant isn't really part of the TND system, but it's where the electricity for the system is produced. We're not going to go into a great deal of detail here. The idea is to help you produce. produced. Power plants are usually classified by the types of fuel they use. There are four types in common use. Fossil fuel plants, nuclear plants, hydroelectric plants, and finally, plants that generate electricity from renewable sources of energy such as solar or wind. Now no matter what kind of fuel they use, power plants always do the same job. They take the potential energy stored in the fuel and change it to electric energy. This one is a fossil fuel plant. It burns coal. Out of all the various types, this one is most common. So it's a good example for us to see some of the main features of power plants in general. Basically, when you look at any power plant, you're looking at a big building that's usually near the water. Water is used for cooling purposes inside the plant. On one end of the building, you'll see a lot of wires and large structures to support them. There's usually a fenced area close by with a lot of electrical equipment inside. This is the switchyard, where electricity from the power plant enters the TND system. These features are common to all power plants, but there are other identifying characteristics of fossil fuel plants. First of all, you can usually see some evidence of the fuel. Fossil fuel plants use coal, oil, or natural gas to produce electricity. These are called fossil fuels because they're actually the remains of fossilized plants or animals. Here, the fuel is coal, so a large coal pile is one of the identifying characteristics. Where oil is burned, you'll see large oil tanks containing fuel for the plant. These of large pipes and valves that deliver gas to the plant. At any fossil fuel plant, you'll see the stacks that discharge the leftover gas. Here, the energy actually comes from the burning of fuel. For nuclear and hydroelectric plants, the ultimate source of energy is different, but inside they all use similar equipment to convert their source of energy into electricity. Regardless of the type of fuel a power plant uses to produce electricity, the actual conversion to electricity is always accomplished by a piece of equipment called a generator. A generator can be considered the real source of electricity for the TND system because it produces the electricity that's carried through the system to the consumer. The generator's electrical output first goes to the unit transformer. This is where the power plant connects to the TND system. When it receives the electricity produced by the generator, the unit transformer increases the voltage. This increase helps push the electricity efficiently along the first part of its journey through the TND system. Often, a unit transformer can be identified by these three large devices called bushings. Bushings are the insulated connection between external and internal components of electrical equipment. The bushings on the unit transformer connect the transformer and the electrical output of the power plant to the first major component of the TND system, the switchyard. Throughout the rest of the program, we'll investigate each of the components that carry electricity from the power plant to the customers that use it. When we return, we'll start moving through the TND system one component at a time.
Like its name implies, a switch yard is simply an enclosed yard full of switches. The switches you see here are larger than the light switches you have in your home, but fundamentally, they... Now, if we look at the T&D system as a whole, we can see where the switch yard fits into the picture. The switch yard connects the electricity generated at the power plant to the transmission system and directs the electricity to the lines that will where it's needed. As we'll see later on, most switch yards are connected to several alternate sources of electricity and several alternate loads. The switch yard is used to select the source of electricity and the path it will follow along its journey. Often, the conductors leaving the unit transformer carry power directly to a switch yard located nearby. The conductors, supported by metal structures, carry electricity from the unit transformer to the major components in the switch yard. Switch yards usually contain two main types of switches, circuit breakers and air disconnect switches. Because the electricity is usually transmitted by three phases, you'll often find these devices in groups of three. Circuit breakers, like their name implies, are often used to open or break an electrical circuit. The switch mechanism is enclosed in a housing. Like the circuit breakers in many homes, these breakers can also be equipped to automatically interrupt the flow of power when certain electrical problems are detected in the transmission circuit. Breakers automatically open, stopping the flow of electricity and preventing damage to equipment and components. Disconnect switches serve a different purpose. They're used to isolate equipment for maintenance or repair. Opening a disconnect provides a visible break in the circuit. If you're working on a circuit that's supposed to be de-energized, you'd open the breaker and the disconnect. That way, even if the breaker is accidentally closed by a remote signal, the open disconnect keeps you and the circuit isolated from voltage. Now we're going to take a closer look at some of the common types of breakers and disconnects. Oil circuit breakers, commonly called OCBs, and sulfur hexafluoride, or SF6 breakers, are different solutions to the same problem. The problem they solve is how to extinguish an arc, the electrical spark that results from opening and closing a circuit. The oil circuit breaker found in switch yards are usually housed in large tanks like these. Now like other circuit breakers, they normally sit side by side in groups of three on a steel and cut on top. Conductors are connected to the bushings on each side of the tank. One conductor goes to the source and the other goes to the load. SF6s have similar bushings and conductors, but their enclosures come in many different shapes and sizes. Both types of breakers have features that help extinguish electrical arcs. To see the differences, let's have a look inside. This is a simplified example of the inside of an OCB that hasn't been filled with oil. These switch cons are opened to connect or disconnect the circuit. With no oil inside, opening and closing the breaker makes a considerable arc. Submerging the contacts in oil helps minimize arcing and its destructive effects. The oil helps extinguish the arc that's created by disrupting the flow of electricity. For contrast, let's see how an SF6 would do the same job. This is a simplified version of the inside of an SF6 breaker. The contacts are in the closed position. Instead, there's a reservoir of SF6 gas, a special insulating gas stored under pressure. When the contacts open, the arc is snuffed out by a high-pressure blast of gas, just like blowing out a candle flame. The contacts open, breaking the circuit without any major arcing inside the housing. The circuit breakers we've investigated so far are just two of the many types that you'll find in switch yards. By looking at SF6s and OCBs, we've seen two very different ways that circuit breakers can extinguish arcs when circuits are opened and closed. On the other hand, disconnect switches don't need many special features for quenching arcs. Circuit breakers do all of the actual switching. Disconnects are open for additional safety to make sure that de-energized equipment stays de-energized. The most common type of disconnect switch is called an air disconnect because the electrical contacts are open to the air instead of oil or insulating gas. Now let's look at a simple example to see how disconnects and circuit breakers work together in a switch yard. In this simplified diagram, we're looking at a single line in the switch yard. Now as we've seen, breakers and disconnects usually come in groups of three. Electricity comes in here, 
current flows through the disconnect, through the circuit breaker, and through the second disconnect to the load. In this case, the load is connected to a transmission line. Usually, we have several sources of power and several loads. In a switchyard like this one, we can select the source and the load in a number of different combinations. Now once again, to get an idea of how this works, we'll go to a simplified example. In this example, we're using single lines to represent the three conductors you'll see in actual switchyard circuits. Now these symbols rep there's no connection between them. Now to see how we can use the switchyard to redirect the flow of power, let's say that this transformer has to be taken out of service. If the other transformer can handle the combined load, we can switch things around so it supplies both transmission lines. The first thing we have to do is tie both lines together using this cross connection. We close the disconnects and then close the circuit breaker. Next step is to remove this source from the circuit. First we open the breaker. Again, by using the breaker to open the circuit, we minimize arcing. Then, once the circuit is broken, we open the disconnect. Now at this point, a single transformer is supplying both of the transmission lines. The other transformer is completely isolated from the circuit. It can now be disconnected from the source without interrupting the flow of electricity from the power plant to the consumer. In the example we've just seen, we examined a relatively simple switchyard arrangement. We had two sources and two loads. In many switchyards, the actual situation is much more complex. There are more sources to choose from and more alternate transmission lines for sending power to the rest of the TND system. After all, the switchyard is a major connecting point. It connects the various power plants in the local area and connects the local power system to From the larger the power grids. Power travels to the transmission lines, advancing one more step along its journey to the consumer. When we return, we'll follow along and take a look at the structures and the equipment that form the transmission lines of the TND system. moving electricity from one place to another. That's what transmission and distribution are all about. Out of all the components in a TND system, transmission lines carry power at the highest voltage and over the longest distance. We'll examine their individual components and see some common variations in construction. To start, we need to know how transmission lines function in the long journey of electricity from the source to the consumer. We've looked at the path of electricity from the power plant where it's produced to the unit transformer where its voltage is increased and to the switchyard where it's routed along the next stage of its journey. Transmission lines form the next part of the local system. Lines also play another role beyond the local system. The continental grids tie individual power companies into larger networks and transmission lines form the connecting links. Through transmission lines, power produced in one area can be delivered to consumers in other parts of the country. To carry the power, transmission lines stretch across miles of countryside. It's a big job, but the equipment that does it is surprisingly simple. Transmission lines are made up of three major components. Conductors are the current carrying wires of the transmission lines. Structures support the conductors above the ground and keep the conductors separated from each other. Conductors are hung from structures by insulators. Insulators prevent conductors from coming into contact with each other and keep them electrically isolated from the structure. A transmission line may carry as much as three quarters of a million volts. Their height above ground and wide separation between conductors are characteristic features that make most transmission lines easy to identify. Now let's look at each component of the transmission lines individually so you can get an idea of their variety and appearance. The current carrying conductors of the transmission lines are usually bare metal wire. You'll almost always see them strung in groups of three. Although construction and materials vary quite a bit, most transmission line conductors look pretty much alike. On the other hand, transmission structures come in a variety of shapes. They also come in every imaginable size. Obviously, there are many, many types of structures, but we can group all of them into two major categories.
poles and towers. Transmission poles are made of either wood or metal. Each wooden pole is usually constructed of one solid piece. They're commonly used in groups of two or three poles to make a single structure. Metal poles are usually hollow. Sometimes two poles are used side by side and connected together at the top with a horizontal piece called a cross arm. This is known as an H-frame structure. Poles used in groups of three can be connected with a cross arm. They can be tied together with wire or they can be totally separated. These are called three pole structures. When you see an H-frame structure or a three pole structure, you're almost certain to be looking at a transmission line. Sometimes though, identifying a transmission structure isn't quite so easy. This single wooden pole is also a transmission structure. Often, transmission conductors are carried by single pole structures in congested areas. Single pole structures are also used to carry distribution conductors. So to identify a single pole structure as a transmission structure, you'd have to rely on other features of the transmission line. Transmission structures is easy to recognize. Metal towers, like these, are much taller than anything you'd find in the distribution end of the system. Towers are usually made up of a framework of crisscrossing metal pieces. This is called lattice construction. A Y-frame tower is shaped kind of like the letter Y with a cross arm on top. A Y-frame stands on a single leg balanced by guy wires that are attached to anchor points around the base of the tower. A V-frame tower is another variation. It's similar to the Y-frame type with an extra upright at the base. All of these designs are intended to serve the same basic purpose, to keep conductors from touching the ground and keep them from touching each other. Now the next type of component we'll examine serves to keep conductors from touching the structure. These are insulators. They connect the conductors to the structure and form an electrical barrier between the two. In cell towers, you'll most often find suspension or disc insulators. A single disc insulator is bell-shaped. Now most often, you'll see several disc insulators strung together supporting a single conductor. This distance between the conductor and the structure is critical. The higher the voltage, the greater the distance has to be. By connecting a number of discs together, you can get exactly the right amount of clearance and the right insulating value for a given voltage. Disc insulators can also be mounted in several different ways for different situations. When a string of insulators is supporting a conductor that's traveling in a relatively straight line, the string hangs vertically from the structure. This is known as the suspension position. When the string is supporting a conductor that's changing direction or holding up the end of a line, there's a strain applied to the insulators, conductor from swaying into another conductor or touching the structure. On tower structures, disc insulators are by far the most common type, but there is another type you'll often see. In congested areas where structures are smaller and voltages are usually less, you'll often find post insulators like these. For every voltage and every setting, conductors, structures, and insulators make up the essential parts of a transmission line. Together, they form the link between the switchyard and the substation in a TND system, moving electricity one step further in its journey to the consumer. Now when we continue, we'll take a look at the next major component along the way. We'll be following the lines to the substation, the connecting point between the transmission and distribution of electrical power. Like the name implies, it's a system that functions on two levels. As a whole, we know it's a delivery system to get the electricity from the power plant to the customers. So far, we've spent our time investing in major components of the transmission side of the system. The switch yard and the transmission lines. Here, we're delivering power on a wholesale level. Large quantities to relatively few locations. On the distribution side of the system, we have power delivery on the retail level. We're sending power in smaller quantities to many different locations, delivering it to the in-use customer. Between these two we have the substation. It's a clearinghouse where wholesale meets retail, where transmission meets distribution.
Substations come in a variety of designs and a variety of sizes as well. But regardless of their size, they all do the same type of job. They receive electricity from transmission lines at a high voltage and reduce the voltage for distribution in a local area. At first glance, a typical substation looks like a cluttered, confusing maze of structures, conductors, and other equipment. But once you know what to look for, it's really much simpler than it seems. Word station. All of the insulators and bushings on station equipment are relatively large. This is the high voltage side of the substation. Where distribution lines leave the substation, the conductors and poles are also a lot smaller than anything you'd see on the transmission side of the system. Now that we know how to tell one end of a substation from another, let's take a look at the components that make it work. To make a substation, all you really need are station transformers, circuit breakers, and disconnects. First, we have to have the station transformer. In a sense, it's the heart of the substation. It's the component emission levels to distribution levels. Transformers are generally the largest pieces of equipment in the substation. Each transformer usually has two rows of bushings on top of it, three large bushings on the high voltage transmission side, and three smaller bushings on the lower voltage distribution side. The next major components of a substation are the switches, the circuit breakers, and in both form and function, a substation is a lot like a switchyard. It just handles power on a smaller scale. The disconnects here serve the same purpose as switchyard disconnects. They are used to isolate equipment and lines for maintenance and repair. Circuit breakers are used to switch the power on or off in the substation. By opening and closing circuits, they also direct the flow of electricity to the appropriate lines for distribution. But there are some similar looking devices in many substations that perform a very different function. This is a special kind of oil field switch called a recloser. In many substations, reclosers are part of the station's equipment for circuit protection. If there's a lightning strike on a distribution line or a fallen line, the recloser will open and after a short interval, it'll attempt to reclose the circuit. If the condition is still present, the switch opens again. Many reclosers can be set up to attempt to close the circuit a certain number of times. Then, if the problem doesn't solve itself, the recloser stays in the open position, protecting equipment and the distribution system from damage. Sometimes, circuit breakers are used to perform the same type of protective function. But unlike reclosers, circuit breakers are not equipped to directly monitor conditions elsewhere in the system. For circuit protection, they have to depend on signals sent by external equipment. Often, the sensing elements and control equipment are contained in a small building on the substation grounds. Those and run circuits. Some of the control equipment operates automatically, and some is designed for manual operation. This is an air circuit breaker. It's a piece of control equipment for manual or remote operation of substation circuits. Like other circuit breakers, it's basically a switch. It's called an air circuit breaker because the switch contacts inside are open to the air instead of being submerged in oil. A control device outside the enclosure can be used to manually operate the breaker. This indicator shows whether the breaker is in the open or closed position. Now that we've seen the types of equipment in a substation, let's put it all together. Get some perspective on how a substation operates as a whole. This simplified portion of a substation consists of a station transformer, five... Now, to make it easier to see what's going on, we're using single lines to represent the three-phase circuits you'll see in almost all T&D equipment. While three-phase circuits are the most common in distribution equipment, beyond the substation, distribution circuits may be either three-phase or single-phase. Right now, let's take a look at the normal path of power through the substation. To start, these switches will have to be closed. High voltage from the transmission circuit enters here. The station transformer reduces the voltage to a distribution levels and sends it to a bus. The bus is simply a rigid conductor that connects different circuits within the substation. From the bus, power flows along this main circuit to another bus. From there, power flows out of the substation along distribution lines. Now let's say the main circuit breaker had to be taken out of service for maintenance or repair.
while it's out of service, will maintain power to the distribution lines through the bypass circuit. The first thing we want to do is establish a parallel path for current to flow through the auxiliary bypass circuit breaker and switches. First we close the disconnects and then we close the circuit breaker to actually make the connection. Now that we have the bypass circuit closed in, we want to open the main circuit. We open the circuit breaker first, then we open the disconnects to isolate the circuit breaker from voltage on both sides. Now the main circuit breaker is completely isolated from all sources of voltage. It's de-energized and ready for maintenance or repair. Electricity still flows through the substation to the distribution lines by traveling through the bypass circuit. By closing the bypass before the main circuit was opened, we isolated the main circuit breaker without interrupting the flow of power through the substation and without putting any customers out of service. We've gone through a typical substation and seen electricity flows to the final stage of its long journey from the power plant to the consumer. When we return, we'll be examining the components that deliver power directly to the homes and the businesses where it's used. We'll be taking a look at distribution lines and power delivery at the retail level. Using electricity. In the end, that's what transmission and distribution are all about. Everything we've seen so far is designed to serve this single purpose, delivering electrical power to the homes and businesses where it's used. It's all to get the power to the customer. Power plants, switch yards, transmission lines, and substations in its final stage. Distribution lines form the last link in a long chain. This is the customer's direct connection linking homes and businesses to the power system. In basic terms, the distribution part of a T&D system consists of the equipment and devices that carry electricity from the substation out into the local area and to the consumers who use the power. In many parts of the country, distribution is mostly overhead with conductors strung from pole to pole throughout commercial and residential areas. In other systems, underground distribution systems are used extensively. Underground systems use many of the same components. They're just hidden away underground where you can't see them. For the purpose of our discussion, we'll just consider the overhead distribution lines so you can get familiar with the components and see how to recognize them. The familiar wooden poles are the most prominent feature of an overhead distribution system. They serve to support the insulators and conductors and they can do it in several different ways. Insulators on distribution poles serve the same purpose as insulators on transmission structures. They electrically isolate conductors and keep them from making contact with other conductors or with poles. This is a pin type insulator. Pin type insulators are the most commonly used type for distribution lines. Usually they're bolted to a cross arm. They're shaped kind of like a mushroom and often made of porcelain. Distribution transformers are another familiar site where overhead distribution is used. Distribution transformers reduce the voltage of electricity from substation levels to a level that can be directly used by consumers. Normally mounted on distribution poles, they have the general shape and appearance of metal cans. On top of each transformer, there are one or more bushings. These bushings are connected to the high voltage distribution conductors at the top of the pole. These high voltage conductors reduce this voltage to 120 or 240 volts which is a common voltage used by consumers. Three or more very small bushings are located on the side of each transformer. These are the low voltage bushings. They're connected to the conductors that carry electricity at the reduced voltage. These conductors are called secondaries. Secondaries are strung between poles below the transformers. Usually they'll extend one or two poles on either side of a transformer. Other conductors are connected at ends along the secondaries. These conductors are called service drops. Service drops carry electricity directly to homes and businesses. We briefly looked at poles, insulators, transformers, and conductors. Now, another common component found in distribution lines are switches. This is one type of switch commonly used in overhead distribution. It's called now cutouts are mainly used as protection devices. They interrupt current flow to equipment that could be damaged in the event of an electrical problem. 
They can also be used to open or close circuits when equipment has to be taken out of service for maintenance. Some cutouts are connected to poles at points in the line where primary conductors branch off towards specific distribution areas. These points are called junctions. Now that we've gone over the major components included in the distribution lines, let's take a look at one simplified portion of a distribution line and trace the path of electricity. These lines represent the high voltage distribution line substation. Again, we're using a single line to represent the three phases you'll see in the field. Electricity flows from the substation, through primaries, and to the transformers located around the area. The transformers reduce the primary voltage of the distribution line to a level that's directly usable by the consumer, which will be 120 240 volts. In a suburban area, the electricity is then carried by secondary conductors that are attached to the pole below the transformer. Service drops which are connected to the secondary conductors carry power from a single transformer to several nearby homes. In a rural area where customers are farther apart, secondary conductors are not used. Instead, the electricity is carried directly from the transformers to a single house using only a service drop. Well now we've gone over most of the major parts of a transmission and distribution system. From the power plant, all the way through to the distribution lines and the individual homes of the consumers. It's a big job, moving electricity all the way from the power plant to the consumers that use it. And as we've seen, it's a long trip with a lot of equipment along the way. As you get more experienced, you'll learn more about how each part of the TND system works moving electricity down the line. The more you look around your own area, the more you'll read transmission and distribution. Thank you.